Welcome to this episode where we discuss one of the most important and pressing questions that plagues pretty much each and every one of us, which is around the concept of time management. But I would like to rephrase the questions that come about in our mind and ask you this question. How do you ensure that your time is well directed? Instead of trying to manage time, can we conduct our activities in a way that ensures that our time is well directed and well aligned to whatever may be the goals, purposes and objectives of our lives or of our jobs or careers or businesses, whatever the case may be. In case you watched my previous episode, you already know that directed refers to a framework that I have created around time management. During this year, I have spent a lot of time introspecting and looking back at the various phases of my life, whether I was in a corporate job, whether I was working as the CEO for an industry leader or heading business development and solutions for a company that is now $4 billion market cap company, as also some vital lessons that I've learned this year from being on my own, from working as an entrepreneur, from working closely as a business advisor with other entrepreneurs. I have distilled the learnings of all of this into this directed framework around time management. As I was looking at the literature and the tools available for time management, I realized one thing, that even though the world has changed, the opportunities have changed, the environment has changed, the entire context of our work life has completely transformed, still we continue to use the tools, the principles, the philosophies and the frameworks that have been enshrined when the world environment was completely different. What this implies is that there is a crying need for a new framework, a new set of tools that can help us deal with today's challenges and uncover tomorrow's opportunities. I am confident that the directed framework will be able to achieve just that. But let us not get ahead of ourselves here. Next year, as we embrace new opportunities and are ready to approach the new year with new vigor, I will be launching a set of initiatives which will help you better understand this directed framework as well as take advantage of it. In today's episode, I would like to focus on the more important issue of what are some of these underlying themes and principles which are enshrined in the development of this framework. If you understand these principles well enough and if you are able to incorporate these in your life, I am sure you will get a lot of value out of it. So here is the first one. As I mentioned at the beginning, I do not like the phrase time management. It somehow gives us the impression that time is an object, is an entity which we need to manage. And very often in our conversations, we end up saying things like, I do not have the time, which essentially means that time is an entity to which we are subordinate and because we do not have it or it is a resource which we do not have access to and hence we are unable to do our jobs. The subtle message that we are sending to our subconscious self here is that the locus of control is not with me but with an entity called time. Time is the one which is controlling me rather than me controlling my time. So I would like you to rephrase this in the times ahead and replace time with priorities. Instead of saying, I do not have time to do something, you should say, doing something is not in my list of priorities at the moment. What this ensures is that you are the boss, you are the one who is controlling your time or rather your actions and your priorities rather than your time being able to control you. However, how you communicate this to others around you is a totally different matter. I would not suggest going to someone and saying, you are not in my list of priorities, so I don't want to have a meeting with you. I am sure you will find more diplomatic ways to do that. But the important point here is, what is the message you are sending to your subconscious self? The second concept is a very simple concept and yet is extremely powerful. While we are talking about maximizing the value of our time, one of the things that immediately should come to mind is the unit of measure. How is it that we are measuring time? Very often you find companies publishing annual reports, which means that the stakeholders who are reading those reports or reviewing or analyzing those reports, their frame of reference or their unit of measure of time is a year. Listed companies do have to declare quarterly results. So their frame of reference or unit of measure becomes one quarter instead of one year. So they are able to crunch their minimum unit of measure of time. Similarly, while reviewing internal operations, most organizations or most functions have a monthly review meeting. So they have crashed this timeline further from one quarter to just one month. And that is how you keep crunching time and ensure 
that you are able to focus more and more and deliver more and more output in that given frame of reference of time. So just to give you an example from one of the leading organizations that approach the standard calendar slightly differently is Unilever. I remember when I worked with them way back in the 90s, they had a concept of journey cycle. Instead of organizing themselves by the 12 calendar months that we typically find in a year, what they did was something creative. They created these journey cycles of four weeks each and the entire organization rallied around these journey cycles. What it ended up doing is created homogeneous cycles of four weeks and instead of 12 cycles in a year, they had 13 cycles in a year. Not just that, every journey cycle or this four weekly cycle was consistent, standard and homogeneous, giving people that opportunity to have a rhythm to approaching the journey cycle instead of a calendar month which may be starting with a weekend or maybe starting with a Monday may have 28 days or 31 days. It just breaks and disrupts the rhythm. In my individual case, what I've been able to do over the years is crunch my timelines for introspection, review, monitoring and managing the things that I have been doing on a periodic basis. While in employment, the employer typically expects you to fill up an annual performance report or performance appraisal report. Hence, the most natural thing to do is to peg your performance to the year. Very few companies have quarterly or monthly reviews of individual performance because that becomes an onerous task and also managers may not have the bandwidth and the systems and processes may not be in place to do this review on a monthly basis. At the same time, some organizations do have those control mechanisms which ensures that you are able to give your maximum each and every month. What I have been able to do and found it extremely useful is to apply this concept of crunch timelines or units of measure in my own life only from the perspective of reviewing and introspecting how I was doing. So a year became a quarter, became a month, became even a week and I crunched this down even to a minimum unit of measure of one day to ensure that each and every day is accounted for. And what I have been able to do over all these years is diligently maintain a record of how my time was being spent on a daily basis. And this was not being done because an employer requires you to do so or your supervisor requires you to do so, but because you need to be accountable to yourself and you can only be accountable to yourself if you are able to do two things. Firstly, you should know what you want to achieve and secondly, you should be able to record, report and review what you have been able to achieve against your targets. So having done this on a daily basis, this year, since I was juggling with multiple priorities, once I started out on my own, I realized that a lot was going on and even a day was not sufficient. So I have taken this concept a notch further and broken down the day into four windows of six hours each. And suddenly I realized that I have a lot more time on my hands and I can do many, many more things than what I was able to do if I had stuck with my unit of measure of time as just one day. And I even shudder to imagine what would have happened if my unit of measure would have been a year, a quarter or a month. This is a nice segue into the third important principle, which is the very famous Parkinson's law. In simple terms, Parkinson's law states that work expands to fill the time. This law is very well known and I'm sure we all have experienced this in our lives, whether it is delaying a project, procrastinating things until the deadline, I'm sure we all have been at the receiving end of Parkinson's law. Remember the time that you procrastinated, left all the important tasks and activities, hoping that it would all get done on the last day. One way to circumvent or take advantage of Parkinson's law is to crash the deadline internally in your mind. Instead of focusing on work for which the deadline is far away, can we reimagine tasks and priorities with a rush deadline so that we are able to complete those tasks and activities and get to our priorities much, much faster than what we would have otherwise been able to do. Just like we have Parkinson's law that has become a mental model or a frame of reference for the entire world, here are a couple of corollaries that I would like to propose. You can think of these corollaries and keep it at the top of your mind and it will help you schedule your day and shape your work priorities so that you can get much more out of the time and ensure that your time is well directed. The first corollary is an inverse of the famous law. My version is that work contracts to meet deadlines. Isn't that powerful? Think about it for a minute and think about the last time when you had an urgent task, an emergency, something to be done immediately 
something needed within the next 10 minutes, you are suddenly able to do something in 10 minutes that would have otherwise taken you an hour or a couple of hours. How does that happen? That is my corollary at work. Work contracts to meet the deadlines. And this is what I was mentioning when I spoke about creating these imaginary deadlines in your head and working towards them so that you are in a heightened state of productivity and ensuring that your time is very well directed. That's not all. The good news is there is a second corollary to this, which is that skills expand to contract the work. Let me give you a moment to digest that. Skills expand to contract the work. If you think about it deeply, how is it that what was otherwise taking you a couple of hours, you were able to do in 10 minutes? The answer lies in the second corollary. You would have inadvertently stumbled upon or discovered or developed some skills which have helped you achieve this task much, much quicker than what you would have otherwise done. And this is all thanks to the first corollary, which is that work contracts to meet the deadlines. Similarly, skills expand to contract the work. So if you are able to impose those artificial deadlines, you will find two things that will happen. Firstly, your skills will expand and as a result, your work will contract. Not only that, the focus will also be maintained because you know in your minds that this is something that does not need sustained attention over a very long period of time. This is something that I can do and achieve in the next few minutes or the next few hours or within today and get the job done and have a sense of gratification or achievement. In this context, there is a great book called Flow, which talks about that experience of flow we have when we are immersed in doing something that we truly enjoy and how time just flies when we are at it. So let's keep our focus on doing things that we enjoy, doing things that are value additive by their very nature. But there is a problem in doing that. The problem is that more often than not, what happens is that time ends up controlling us. And by time, I mean everything else that is going on around the world. We become the servant of our routines and we do not take time out to review and examine and introspect on what is really happening, what our true priorities are. And why don't we do that? Because that would take away from the artificial deadlines and the incorrect measures of productivity that are imposed upon us. We tend to mistakenly believe that doing a mundane task and doing more and more units of that mundane task is equivalent to productivity. Whereas if we were to take a step back and think about what is truly value additive for us, in the time and space that we are in currently, we may have come up with maybe totally different answers. This is an abstract concept which you may find very difficult to implement it in practice. So here is a mental model or a frame of reference that I typically use when I am thinking about time and the way I review and introspect about how I am spending my time. This trick is not about time, but it is around cognition. In other words, about the way we think. And here I am borrowing from Daniel Kahneman's theory of system 1 versus system 2 way of thinking. In case you are not aware of what system 1 and system 2 thinking are, I have already created a video where I explain some of these concepts in a little amount of detail. I can create a more detailed video around it. But in a nutshell, system 1 is essentially the fast mode of thinking, the automatic way of thinking where life has taken control over you and you are a servant of your calendar, of your schedule, of the priorities that the world has thrust upon you. This happens in an automatic mode where you are probably not even thinking and the responses that you generate are automated responses based on past experiences and patterns that you may have observed. In contrast to that, system 2 thinking or the slow thinking is the more deliberate thinking where you are taking a pause, you are taking a breather and you are thinking more deeply about what your priorities are, how you are spending your time, is it aligned with your overall goals, purposes and objectives or not. Is this something that you really need to do? Should it be part of your priority list? All of these questions require a lot of thought before you can come to the answer. These are not hardwired in your brain and this is not something that you can rely upon from past experience and give an intuitive answer without even thinking or without even slowing down. So that is what slow thinking is all about and the power of slow thinking. What I would encourage you is to observe when is it that you are in a fast thinking mode and how many times in a day or in a week you are able to switch over to the slow thinking mode and make those adjustments which align your time, your priorities and your activities to your bigger objectives, goals and purposes. And lastly, 
before you get into the mode of system 2 of slow thinking of deliberate thinking i would love for you to continue in your system 1 way of thinking and fast thinking and do what you always need to do after watching a video which is like and share the video subscribe to the channel and do leave your comments behind on what you found valuable in today's video and what are some of the tips and tricks that you use to manage your time better and with that see you in the next episode